Okay, go on. Amazing start to a very busy track today. So our, our next speaker, the topic actually caught my eye. It's something that's pretty close to my heart, this personalization at scale. I come from a marketing automation background, so anything I can use with my customers to help personalization and scale it up is going to speak to me. And this guy certainly knows what he's talking about. I see him grinning and smiling at the back of the room, ready to go. So he is the director of engineering over at Adobe. A big job, and he's delivered some of my favorite products from Adobe over the last few years. Things like the live search system, product Rex, and such. So I, I'm delighted to introduce Fad Siddiqui. All right, thank you, everybody. First of all, great to be here. Um, I'm Fahad Siddiqui. I'm the Director of Engineering for uh, Adobe Commerce Data Solutions Group. Um, that's me. Those are the places you can catch me online. And uh, Adobe Commerce Data Solutions Group is generally responsible for intelligent commerce solutions. Uh, so we're responsible for Adobe Commerce Life Search, uh, product recommendations, MBI, just to name a few. And we're Basically, uh, in future, um, we're uh, looking for personalization at scale and um, how we're doing there. So for the next 20 minutes, I'm excited to talk to you about our journey into personalization at scale, where we were um, in the last four years, basically. A lot happened, you know, global pandemic being one of them. Um, and then I'm also going to go into a little bit of how we deliver uh, these uh, experiences uh, using our SaaS delivery model, and then also that we are not leaving extensibility behind. Um, so a lot of that, and then end up with a little bit of a sneak uh, future work that we're doing. But before all that, um, let's get to the basics and the why of it all. And the why of it all has to be our customers and how we drive gross merchandise value, or GMV, for our customers, right? Uh, broadly speaking, it's a basic, uh, pretty simple equation, and br broadly speaking, GMV is proportional, directly proportional to these three levers. You can increase shopper traffic, or you can increase conversion rate, or you can increase average order value. And any one of those will result in greater GMV. So how do the merchants do that? Uh, for increasing their shopper traffic, they can uh, go with uh, more sales channel. Uh, they can have marketing campaigns. Um, and that is why omni-channel is very important in this context. For improving conversion rates, um, you can look at um, product discovery. How do you enable that product discovery? And if you can do that, then you can actually have um, you know, bigger uh, conversion rates of the traffic that is coming in. And then finally, uh, you try to increase your order volume. Uh, that can be done by cross-sells or upsells. And all of that, as I said, pretty simple formula there. You increase your shopper traffic, you improve conversion rate, you increase average order volume, and you basically increase your digital sales. We see that just from our launch of product recommendations, our merchants seeing um, upwards of 20% in their average order volume. And this is actually true if you look at the statistics. Um, we know that 86% of customers say that personalization does play a role in their purchase with 62% of customers saying that they actually use product recommendations and brands and sometimes even pay more for the products that are recommended to them. And obviously, that makes sense, as you can see when Amazon reports that 35% of their sales, of Amazon sales, that's not a chump change, right, by any means, is actually attributed to their recommendations. So we know that personalization plays a big role in it. And 
when I'm not, this is a pretty busy slide, but again, we're staying true to our original goal of why, why it is important to us, and that is our customers, right? Um, and there are so many offerings there that you can see at the bottom of the slide there. And the point I'm trying to make here is all of our offerings, we can talk about a lot of complicated solutions and the really awesome technology behind it, AI, ML, field experiences, but all of them pretty much can be categorized broadly into these three main areas, shopping traffic, conversion rate, and average order volume. So anything that you have out there, you should be able to draw a straight line there. So now that we know that pers uh, personalization plays a really awesome role there, where were we in 2018 as Adobe Commerce, formerly known as Magento, right? We were at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, like, really, we were at the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. And we received from analysts zero out of five in AI and ML experiences in 2018. We got one, a whopping one out of five in search experiences, which was basically an acknowledgement that you have some kind of search coming out of the box. You have a search bar. We'll give you one. Great. So we had some work cut out for us. And so I actually just copy-pasted the slides from 2019 that we envisioned for our future. So uh, I identify them with an orange banner on the top right of the slide that says 2019. So we said we definitely need a product recommendation. It would be an AI-driven product recommendation. By the way, just imagine yourself in 2019 and getting those ratings and saying, this is what we want to do, really, right? Pretty tall order, right? We wanted to intelligent merchandising, right? We should, uh, which is basically, uh, if you know about like social feeds, it's like a product feed for your shopper, right? Every home page for your um, customers um, is going to be personalized. We talked about having visual search. This is 2019, like we should have visual search because a lot of time, uh, you have products and the recommendations are not textual based. You, you're, for example, a furniture store. So my wife is into like vintage uh, kind of um, pieces. And so it's not very easy to describe them in textual words and stuff, but you know exactly what this is the kind of coffee table I'm looking for, except, you know, it's just I want something different. And so that's where you can get those kind of things. Being color aware, so this is, you know, you're retailing, um, you know, you have a certain style or whatever, and AI and ML can definitely help you there. And then, of course, you need your personalized search. Uh, that is not just, um, you know, textual, inverted index based, but actually um, context aware as well. Now, all of this, I want to say right now, it's not like I'm going to tell you we did it, and all of this is done. We're far from done. We, ha we have a lot of them GA today, but not everything is, is done. It's coming soon. Um, so what did we do, right? So we went off with product recommendations, and we uh, GA'd that on June, if I'm not wrong, uh, June 2020. Um, this was a big, big leap for us. Number one, it was a little bit challenging coming from nowhere, trying to uh, create the machine learning pipeline that we wanted to use for uh, behavioral data because the recommendation have two things. One, obviously, uh, the relevance of products to each other, but then also browser behavior, the browser history, their order history, and based off of that, you want to show them their recommendation. Plus, there are several recommendation types that we have today. You know, we started off with a few, but we kept adding to them, as I'll uh, say in a minute. And then one year later, we actually um, pretty ambitious with our life search product. Uh, the key there was, as we were moving along this journey, we tried to reuse as many components as we could. And, and this will be important as I move to our SaaS delivery platform. And same thing with life search. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so product recommendations. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we had intelligent recommendation type, behavioral data that we went out with. But then post GA, and we are still actually um, improving upon it. In fact, ranking indicators or readiness indicators 
uh, was the last thing that came out this year. And so there's a lot of good stuff there. For Lysert, uh, similarly, we started off, uh, and I'm actually going to go deep into intelligent faceting and some of uh, the areas that, that, that I really um, just, just it ceases to amaze me what our team could, could produce here. Uh, we were also able to provide reporting to our customers and attribute where their money was being spent and how much their ROI is happening. So we have that out of the box. The B2B catalog pricing, this came out like two months ago um, in our June release. This was a big deal as well because in, in live search, when you're talking about, or search in general and personalization, when you're talking about B2B, all of a sudden your problem is space uh, has a big explosion because it's even if you have a million SKUs, which you know honestly is not big enough, but if you have thousand customer groups or thousand pricing books, all of a sudden your problem space has exploded to a billion effective SKUs, right? So this 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 was a big uh, um, you know achievement on our part. Uh, finally, as I mentioned, I'll talk about uh, what intelligent faceting is. So just. Um, uh, forget about all the technicalities for a second and just imagine you're walking into Best Buy or something and you're looking, you're in the market for a TV, right? And, uh, and the customer representative of the sales rep comes to you and say, can I help you with something? And you go, yeah, I'm looking for a new TV. And the next question they ask, yeah, what's your jeans size? You know, you'll be like, huh? And, and so that is what happens when you go to uh, a search bar and you type in TVs, and on the facets, filters, you see gene size or something like that, or color. Like, you know, I guess color is important for TVs. I don't think I've ever filtered any TV by color or something, but yeah. So what can you do? So mostly what happens here is manual faceting. So a merchandiser or a merchant admin can go in and say, hey, for this keyword, uh, make sure you put these filters up, right? Um, and, and this becomes practically impossible pretty soon for two reasons. One, a lot and a lot of merchants, they have very diverse catalogs, right? There's not like just one thing that, okay, cool, I'm just doing this one thing and that's it, so I can have fixed hard-coded filters and I'm good. The other thing is it can, it can be pretty hectic manually going in for changing product types. So you can think about customers like fast fashion, right? And they, they can have new kinds of sizes, new kind of trends going along that people are looking for. So how do you maintain that? How do you get somebody manually to go in there and say, yeah, for this keyword, you do something? And that is where intelligent faceting comes along. So the goal of it is based on whatever search the user does, you know, regardless, automatically figure out what are the key significant features that you, they would like to filter on, right? And so this is also known as feature selection, and we employ some of the existing abilities of Elasticsearch and others like JLH score. And what it basically does is that if you're looking for genes, right, and then in, in your entire catalog, uh, gene size comes in about 5% of your merchandise, right? But in the result set that happens as a result of your search for genes, it appears 95% of time. So live search automatically understands that, okay, this is, um, this is you know, pretty clear that this attribute is focused for this result set, and so it will automatically put that up in, in your facets on the right side. Uh, we have a synonym search. As I said, our work is far from done. It's still not smart synonyms that is coming, but it is something that uh, people can do today. They can have a one-way synonym and they can have two-way synonyms. So one-way synonym, you can say like if somebody's asking for winter clothes, you can have a one-way synonym to jacket, uh, sweaters, but maybe not like vice versa because if somebody's more specific, you don't want to give a broader uh, result set. And finally, um, in future, this is not there yet, but we do want to integrate with the broader Adobe Experience Cloud offering uh, to help with personalization and scale. I'll go into it in a few minutes as well. So where did that lead us? So this is where we are now. So Forrester ratings for 2022 gave us five out of five uh, in all of um, AI, ML, and site search. And 
Uh, those are some of the quotes that they had there. Um, I put some things in bold uh, because I do want to go through those things. For example, all of our uh, new features in this space are cloud native. Uh, and as usual, I'll start with the why first. Uh, again, just because it's five out of five, that is not the end of the story. Um, I really feel we are far from done and there's more coming. It just is in, uh, I feel five out of five is just us catching up. So that's, that's how I feel about it. So I mentioned about cloud native capabilities. I mentioned about our commerce SaaS delivery platform. And so let's just start again with the why of it. And the pain point there is we have bespoke implementations every time um, there's an AI ML field experiences. And the reason is, um, you know, intuitive, which is you need uh, personalization also means you need to be very close to what your shoppers are doing. Uh, you need to create uh, ML pipelines. You need to create all these uh, things that are running. Then you need to maintain them. And uh, pretty quickly, that becomes a very bespoke implementation, right? So what does SaaS delivery platform um, gives us? Again, I tried to simplify everything first. And to me, it's really abstraction and elastic scale. Abstraction meaning abstraction of complexity. So that when you approach every single merchant, you don't start from scratch, but you actually say, yeah, there are these big things. There are you know, intelligent faceting that I just talked about. There are you know, several other things, right? Uh, how do we um, do uh, product recommendations, AI, ML algorithms, and all of that, right? So we can give you, abstract you out of all that, right? And we give you the, we maintain that pipeline on our end. Uh, we maintain the SLAs and the SLTs on our end. So you kind of are abstracted out of that and just have that it just works kind of uh, experience. And the other thing is elastic scale. And elasticity is slightly different, not slightly actually, it is different from saying um, I have uh, ability to do uh, 10 million effective SKUs or 250 million effective SKUs, which is great. However, what elasticity promises is that it can be infinitely elastic, uh, infinitely scalable. Now I put infinitely in quotation because you know there's always a limit. Uh, but what it tells you is that you have an architecture that allows you to throw money at it to solve your scalability problem, and that's actually great, right? If you can do that. And um, so basically, what we have seen, and and the only way, and I, I think we have demonstrably. Uh, being successful at it is the only way we can do this is by incremental value that we provide to the market, right? If you try to go for a big bang approach, um, you know, you may be successful in some instances, but it's very hard um, in my experience at least. So customers are used to getting huge value, advanced AI ML capabilities in consumable cloud capability. So now, I want to right away talk about extensibility. We cannot leave extensibility behind. You know, just by experience with our Mergento community and just knowing merchants, every merchant has to give an experience, uh, their, their shoppers an experience that is customizable to them. So we cannot leave it behind. And in this model, the paradigm of extensibility shifts from in process to out of process. I would recommend uh, watching great talks by Igor Minialo, our chief architect, and Nishant Kapoor on, on explicitly on extensibility and what we're, what we're doing there, right? So main thing first is I want to go ahead and just say that this is a different paradigm of extensibility. It may not be one-to-one -one if you're going from in process customization that you're used to to like out of process extensibility, but the intention is there. So first of all, there are two aspects to it. The first is API first design principle. Everything in our SaaS offering is API first uh, all the way down. So from ingestion pipelines, it's not uh, tightly coupled with Adobe Commerce to uh, application level APIs. The trick there is there's a balance there. You can either be very granular with your APIs, so that gives you maximum flexibility, but that can also be very brittle. On the other hand, you can have very coarse high-level 
um, APIs and it will become a black box. So people who want to extend them, they wouldn't be able to do so. So there's a fine balance somewhere in there and we strive to look for that balance. The second very important thing, and this is actually in beta now, so you can actually go to Adobe Experience Cloud or Experience League and see documentation there, is our API Mesh. And what API Mesh is our multi-tenant SaaS GraphQL uh, layer, but it allows you to change natively the GraphQL schema that you are going to consume. So imagine trying to change the data model while still taking the benefit of SaaS offerings, but adding this one more attribute. Maybe you want to get shipping rates from different cust uh, shipping carriers, right? And you want to customize that checkout experience. Instead of writing uh, JavaScript SDKs and stuff, you can just update your data model, and you can go to GraphQL API Mesh and provide that new attribute by just maintaining um, an app builder function um, serverlessly. And as a canonical example, of course, this is a very, very high level architecture, but this is how most of our SaaS offerings work, right? So in case of live search, we know we need catalog sync, so the, the, that happens behind the scenes. We're just syncing all the catalog feeds. Uh, We're also syncing order feeds, uh, customer feeds, and other things, depending on whatever SaaS um, offering you have installed. Then you have a search management layer in your admin console that goes directly to search admin service. And then your storefront search requests are going directly to these um, search APIs. Again, this is just meant to show you a canonical SaaS service. And then this is in beta right now. Uh, what we are doing is um, for the catalog storefront service, and this is an eye chart uh, a little bit where you can see that the latency can be reduced by orders of magnitude by going to SaaS as well. Again, this is API first, so you still have that capability in your GraphQL API mesh to update your data models. Um, and of course, you have your client to storefront. You can either do it headlessly um, or create your own uh, components uh, for whatever storefront you are on. So that leads me to future work. Um, as I mentioned, I feel like uh, even though we have enough to you know, pat ourselves uh, on our back, but I feel like we're just catching up. So I, I, I want to talk about this, this thing about inverted index versus vector search a little bit. Just to uh, back up, most of the searches that we're talking about here are inverted index, which is basically you have a document. So in our case, there's products right, and product description. You take the product description, you tokenize it, get the keywords out of it, and then you invert the index, meaning now your index are those keywords. So now when a customer comes in and they provide you those keywords, out comes all these document IDs or your products that, that are relevant to that keyword, right? Now, of course, there's more advancement there, but basically that's the idea. One thing about this is this is fast. However, it doesn't take context into, into the picture. So context being, well, if the weather is rainy, you probably want to recommend jackets that are rain jackets, right? Things like that, right? Um, by the way, the typos and stuff, those are taken care of by inverted index pretty easily. Um, and that is where vector search comes into play. And, and this is in the future, uh, which is, I think it's not like future future, I'm just talking about very medium term or short term future, because we're already seeing uh, these algorithms coming from academics like HNSW into commoditizing into open source software with uh, FIS, uh, that's an implementation model coming out of uh, Facebook or Annoy from Spotify. And, and, and what can be done then is uh, pretty easily people will be able to use vector search, right? The trick is still is going to be about those vectors. So how rich your vectors are, the more relevant your um, search is going to be. And that is where um, you know, the, the, the competitive market is going to play along, right? The, the more vectors, you, the, the more input, the more good input you have in your vectors, the better, better your search is. Oh, and one more thing I forgot to mention at the last bullet. Uh, so that's, that's really good from technical, and I really uh, geek out on these things, so this is, this is great. But the challenge is actually on the product side. The, pr uh, the challenge is, not, right now, the way you do search indizing is you provide 
keywords and stuff like that. But how are you going to capture intent? Uh, we, uh, I don't have an answer for that. I'm pretty sure there were smarter people than me working on that problem. Do you like put a text box and say like just type in English and we'll just figure it out? Maybe that is the answer. Maybe that is where we are going. But that is going to be the next uh, future thing. And uh, finally, as I mentioned before, intelligent browse merchandising. That is something that we're working on. And this is basically just like how you know, you go to Amazon and your Amazon page is going to be completely different from mine. We want to provide this uh, feature um, of basically having a product feed uh, personalized for shoppers. And finally, um, in the not so near future, we are going to provide uh, you know, integrations with the broader Adobe Experience Cloud uh, with things like RTCDP, uh, AJO, Adobe Jour uh, Journey Analytics, um, so that you know, those vectors that I was talking about are enriched as much as possible and we uh, provide the full power of Adobe to our enterprise customers. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, we have some time for questions, so definitely if you have any questions. Oh. Good question. So just to repeat the question, you know, is Life Search a stable, I think? Uh, is there a stable release for it? Uh, with Life Search, do we still need Elasticsearch for it with our cloud instances, right? So Life Search has been around, like since 2021, it is a stable. Uh, obviously, there's more coming, um, but but yes, um, there's 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 nothing. Uh, you know, we have SLAs uh, of less than 250 millisecond response times, and um, you know, so so yes, it is a stable. Now about Elasticsearch that is on cloud, and it's really the correct answer is it depends. Uh, Life Search does not use Elasticsearch directly at all. So if that is the only use case you have, you may uh, benefit from uh, deprecating Elasticsearch and maintenance of Elasticsearch cluster on your side. Uh, but if you have things, customizable things and extensibility um, things that actually use that Elasticsearch, then that, or, or extensions that use Elasticsearch, uh, then obviously you would need it for your own reasons. No, no, you have, you get an admin panel for life search, yes. No, that's right. So, yeah, we would love to know those edge cases. Uh, we are uh, usually take care of UTF uh, character encoding that should take care of any special characters. Uh, but, yeah, there may be tokenizing issues with quotation marks like you mentioned and all that. So that definitely would love to hear on that. Um, when you said admin panel, okay, I think I see your question where it is going. So we do have admin panel where you can boost and bury and all those kind. You can pin a particular result and uh, if you want to sell more of a certain product. So that's great. Uh, but I think your question is even more like how can we impact the algorithm of tokenization itself? Uh, that kind of customizability is not there in the admin panel right now. That is that was true until two months ago. So we just like in June of this year we released B two B pricing as well with Life Search. Yeah. Where do you see natural language processing in the distance? So I mean, I, I think natural language processing is definitely on our roadmap. Um, I am not a product guys, so these things keep going up and down in the priority list, but it is definitely on our roadmap. So, yeah. Again, with national, uh, I, I kind of sum, I kind of like 
cluster all of them together sometimes like of course NLP is its own it's its own feature and it's it's its own area but then vector search kind of also goes hand in hand with that so we'll see how how this progresses yes Right. I mean, I mean, of course, anybody can pick this up and, and get the same experience that an enterprise can have. I mean, the only thing is uh, we need is a Magento Adobe Commerce, uh, um, not Magento, Adobe Commerce uh, entitlement. Um, but then search or personalization at scale, none of that um, uh, has its own offer code or anything. Like, you don't have to pay anything extra beyond the Adobe Commerce license. So that is definitely one uh, in, uh, license uh, or entitlement that we need um, for you to have access. But if you if you get that, then yeah. But just in general, it's not available to open source. Oh yeah, yeah. So I I think I think what you're asking is the API mesh, right? Yes. So API mesh is available. Um, I, actually, I should not say it's available because I don't know. But API Mesh has the ability to actually go back into the monolith and use the GraphQL APIs or any APIs for that matter um, uh, from the monolith. In fact, that is how you can actually move, if you want to, from the monolith to any of your APIs or third-party uh, APIs. Um, and Ray had a really good um, session on like composable commerce, so it kind of goes hand in hand with that. Say that again. Okay. Okay. It is uh, Igor Minyalov has uh, confirmed it is available for public beta. Um, good question, like um, how does it um, interact with extensible, like if you want to make it extensible, like as in you want to apply your own algorithms and stuff. So th there's a f level of extensibility, right? So we try to provide with, through admin console like things that a merchant admin would need. Uh, boost and berry, you know, rules, like at what rules I want to not like show my out of stock things. So those things you can do. Um, it is debatable how far we want to go with allowing, because then that kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? And maybe it is a good thing. Maybe it is uh, for, for more advanced users, they may want to like say like, hey, we have our own tokenizer. Can you take this and can you deploy it in our space so that we don't become a noisy neighbor for anybody else? Maybe that's possible, but so far I, I, I don't think that that's where uh, we are. No, yeah, not right now, but that is in the roadmap as well. Not right now, we do have like stock statuses, so you can use those, um, low stock, out of stock, but actually stock numbers, uh, you know, that is not supported. Or with customer groups, uh, I think you can do that. Um, Igor, you wanted to... Um, that can be done. So lately what we can do is uh, if you have um, any, so pricing is one example but um, and the most used example, but if you have any product overrides um, with shared catalog or something like that, but it's on you, like we are not going to detect the zip code or anything, but if you have that, then we can respect those things while returning the search results. 
this is um, like, as I mentioned, this was released as of June um, 2022. So. Right? Are we good? All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.